So today we're going to be digging into the Smith Maneuver Chapter 5 of the Fraser Smith book. And we're going to be talking about interest expenses, uh, how they are tax deductible, what separates them. And we're also going to try our best to get Chris involved to give some good housekeeping tips, uh, talk about using debt to pay debt. And um, I, I want to touch on a couple of questions where I see investors regularly or people implementing the Smith Maneuver go wrong. So uh, really quickly, interest that is created because you borrowed to invest with a reasonable expectation of income, generally speaking, is tax deductible. So interest that is created from a debt used to create an investment with a reasonable expectation of earning income is usually tax deductible. Debt for jet skis, travel, generally not. Um, there are some more nuanced situations, and this is one I wanted to hit you with early, Chris. If someone buys raw land, can that be argued an investment? Does it depend on your background? Like there's no income potential there. Ge and, and the answer is generally no, um, just because they're, they are actively looking for, for that income, not uh, 10 years down the road sort of income. They, they want that expectation to be occurring relatively close to the time where the lending occurred. Um, and in the same way, like they have specific exemptions written, written in, obviously, um, that borrowing can't be for something that's in a tax shelter and it can't be within a life insurance policy or any form of insurance. Those are uh, explicitly written into, um, into the deductibility rule. And uh, so you, you can't directly you know, do infinite banking um, with the Smith Maneuver and, and that sort of process. You can't uh, intertwine the, the strategies. One is you know happening on the outside of tax thing, um, and and some is within the, within the tax regime. So, I mean, I think you had a great you know short video the other day about how you can use some of the cash damming um, approaches to fund your TFSA as um, you know as an alternative way of getting some money into a um, into your RSP or sorry into your TFSA. Um, so there are, you know, when you're closely monitoring how that cash is moving, there are still options even within the shelters to still get, you know, get some of the deductibility going. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I think this is where people have to be really careful. You cannot use the Smith Maneuver to fund your TFSA, but you can use the Smith Maneuver to free up cash flow to fund your TFSA. And the odds of a regular person knowing all the nuances to apply this correctly and not get themselves blown up is generally pretty minimal, I would say. Because even the, as an example, the me discussing and making a video about how you can use the Smith Maneuver to free up cash flow to fund your TFSA, I spoke to two accountants and one financial advisor before I did that. I do my homework, even though I know this stuff pretty damn close to inside out. Um, but back to the book. So the chapter discusses essentially the Consumer debt is non-tax deductible. If it's for your own use, your own pleasure, at the end of the day, if you're not expecting to earn income from it, it doesn't fly. It's not tax deductible. Now, the mistake that most Canadians make is that we've been raised to pay off our mortgage and to have minimal retirement savings along the way because we are doing our best to be good boys and girls and pay off the mortgage. The problem is that we, we hit our 53rd birthday. We make our last mortgage payment. We're free and clear. We don't have to pay for housing, but we do we still have our property taxes, our insurance, our maintenance, our utilities, upgrades we need to make, whatever it may be. Um, at the end of the day, we still have cash needs. So simply eliminating the cost of our housing by no means means we get to live for free. The problem with that approach is that we can end up in a situation where we're 62, we've got $440,000 in RSPs, the government gives us $24,000 a year, our house is paid off, and we very quickly realize that we can't afford to live. So then in the book, they demonstrate a graph where the debt level gradually declines, stays flat, and then starts to spike back up as people get older. And we see this, and this is a reason why reverse mortgages exist. In 99.9% .9 of time, they're awful. They're extremely expensive. They are the best of a series of bad options. The reason that we like the Smith Maneuver is it completely turns this concept on its head and it lets you reduce the cost of your mortgage and save for retirement faster, which puts you in a situation where if you're retired and you've got $4 million of assets and you've got a $600,000 mortgage, well, in my opinion, that's a lot better than you've got a $0 mortgage and you've got $500,000 of assets. 
each to their own. And that's the reason you should do your own due diligence and never trust just what we're talking about. But I'll stop stalling. Let's jump into the tax side of it. So Chris, I butchered it. I've given the layman's version of it. What is the, the legal or the tax definition of tax deductible versus non-tax deductible? Well, I think you basically noted it. It has to be in, or interest on a, a debt that was directly tied and leads to taxable income. And so the taxable income has a lot of broad definitions. For instance, when I was doing the Smith Maneuver myself, my investments or my re-advances from my mortgage, I bought businesses. I, I bought accounting firms. Right. I used the funds that I freed up from the purchase of my um, or the, down, the, the payment of my mortgage to buy other businesses. So it doesn't have to be strictly stocks and bonds. It doesn't have to be you know, strictly other real estate. It just has to be leading to taxable income. And so, again, you have a large variety of, of things that will create taxable income, your side hustle your you know your actual incorporated lending to your incorporated business that pays you a dividend every year or pays you you know it's it, you know uh, wages you know you're deriving income and you from those investments you know private lending whether that's you know again the traditional stocks and bonds there's a a, a very very wide range of investments that are going to meet that criteria but the critical portion is that it, it it's going to have to be taxable. So where people will, they always, they're trying to kick the, you know, they're trying to get two kicks at the can, right? So I'm going to buy a, a stock portfolio knowingly that it's going to be all return of capital. Well, you're going to find yourself offside because it's not creating taxable income, right? It's, it is only returning its capital on a tax-free manner. So you can find yourself offside in that regard. That is written strictly into that definition that you need to be tying that back to uh, back to the taxable income. And CRA, you know, as much as you know, clients they love their oh, this is you know, this is tax deductible. The onus is on the taxpayer to prove that you have met the requirements, and that's where people um, will get sideways is is because. CRA has strict rules related to it. You can't, you know, cont have contaminated the line of credit. For instance, the example that is commonly get given is you take out ten thousand, or you take out a hundred thousand for investing, and then in your line of credit, and then you advance an extra ten grand so that you can go on vacation, and then a month later you get your bonus. You pay that ten grand back. From your perspective, you are paying back the 10 grand that was non-deductible in that line of credit. From CRA's perspective, they say you now have 90,000 deductible and 10,000 non-deductible. Their viewpoint is on um, is that you are paying back deductible interest. And so in the same way, if there's any possibility of using that line of credit, for personal use, you know, personal renovation, all of those sorts of things. Well, then you should be separating your lines of credit, having different tranches, and uh, and so that you can have that personal access to credit potentially, if you needed to have it for personal use, and not worry about contaminating it for for interest deductibility. In the same way, if you were wanting to separate portfolios, for instance. You know, within my own context, we ended up with three different tranches of our line of credit because there's one tranche in my wife's name, there's one tranche in my name, and then there's one tranche that, tranche that we use for personal use. So our renovation went on the line of credit. My wife's borrowing for her investing went on her line of credit, and my line of credit went... Um, it, you know, was used for my purposes, then I can deduct 100% of the interest related to that one segment or that one tranche. And then, you know, she was able to deduct, you know, correspondingly um, the, the portion related to her borrowing. Um, rather than if you had one single line of credit, you would more than likely have to divide it 50-50 on the two tax returns. So if you want to have more specialized, 
specialized, you know, deductions. But in the same way, you're tying that back to interest. So again, you can't create situations where one, the high earner, you know, takes out the hundred thousand dollars of of borrowing, puts it into the wife's a portfolio in the wife's name. She claims all the income, and you claim all the deductions to try to to try to play that game. Well, that doesn't work because again. Uh, in order, according to the interest deductibility rules, you have to have created taxable income. So you can't play that sort of, of game with it. You have to tie it back to the income that you created for yourself and declared on your own returns and in order to have that deductibility. So I saw there was a, in the chat, you know, where are those rules? Well, if you just go to CRA's website and type in interest deductibility, um, there will be what's called a folio, and the folio is um, uh, their PDF ex explanatory thing of various contexts and the rules surrounding. And I think the interest uh, folio is I don't know, 40 or 50 pages, um, and like I said, it's, it's easily ac accessed by just going to CRA's website and ty typing in interest deductibility. Um, it will take you right to right to a PDF that that explains these things. I think the one thing you have to be careful of, though, is if you're reading through said 50 page document, you do not read one situation and misinterpret it as another and then think, oh, I'm on side because it says not knowing that the CRA may be discussing a completely different set of circumstances. And that's why someone like Chris goes to school for how many years? Seven. <laughs> Just as much education. <laughs> it's like a bloody doctor. Is it just as much as a doctor or a lawyer, yeah. And um, so, in the in the in the same way, um, what people who are doing the Smith maneuver do you know, to go back to the direct Smith maneuver, you know, conversation, is what people don't realize is that this deduction is going to be on each and every tax return for years and years on end, and this is a chain of events. Right, the the balance in that line of credit is growing and growing. So it's not a matter of if you are going to get audited; it's a matter of when you are going to get audited. And so if you get audited in year ten, and you know you were going by the rule of thumb that you only had to keep your records for seven years, and you shredded all of the big investments that you did in year one you potentially have now that CRA is looking back, they want to see the entire chain of events that led to the deductibility. So if you shredded those documents from year 10, now you don't, you no longer have proof of when you did the original investment. So it is very, very critical to keep that chain of events because like I said, that interest deduction, you know, in year one, maybe you have $500 of interest. It's going to be relatively minor. Year 10, you might have 15,000. Well, anytime there's a line item on a tax return, it is an auditable item. So it's going to come up on their random searches. And not all that many people have carrying charges. So it is something that gets examined on a semi-frequent basis. And if you have that line item at each and every year, you are going to get looked at. It's, it's a matter of, of that Russian roulette. So you better keep the documents, right? You have to... to, to and, and it should be relatively straightforward, right? You just need to, you know, from a practical per, uh, perspective, you would, um, you know, print off your 12 months of line of credit statement. You log into your online banking, say, where's my line, you know, print my transactions from January 1st to December 31st, save that document. Where's my Smith Maneuver checking account? What's my transactions from January 1st to December 31st? Print that document to PDF. Where's my portfolio you know, deposits? And again, you can get a report of the deposits you made into your portfolio from most lenders and so, or most um, uh, trading platforms. So again, you'd print that document from December to, or January to December. Now, again, you have three, three documents and you have the whole chain, chain of events that ties things together. You know, this isn't a matter of keeping hundreds and hundreds of pieces of paper. You just need to keep where the original, you know, each and every time that those investments were made. And one of the, the you know, the, the true Smith Maneuver, you know, thing involves investing on a month-to-month -month basis. 
But that's one of the, the really powerful items of, of the Smith maneuver is that there can be flexibility. You can just, you know, let the balance build up. It gets to, you know, every 10 grand of available credit, you advance the 10 grand and do a single investment in that go instead of doing month to month investments. You, because you have control over when you're readvancing or how much you're readvancing, you can have flexibility rather than, you know, $500 or $1,000 getting invested every month, you could just save it up for a number of months, right? There is customizability and control over these, these items. So it, it isn't just a one, uh, one trick pony. It can do a lot of varied, varied things um, that, that give that extra power, right? You could save it up for multiple years and then put that extra down, you know, you've saved it up to 50 grand and now it's the down payment for the next rental property. Um, there are a lot of those things that are flexible within within the the strategy. So, do you do you suggest that people implementing the Smith maneuver try to find the most the simplest version of the strategy that works for them and gets them to their goals, or are you a fan of tinkering and optimizing to try to get 100% efficiency, even if it means a drastic increase in paperwork or effort? No, I think that generally people should dip their toes into it because it is so flexible. I think that people should do the very base minimum for the first few months until they actually get used to how those cash flows work. What's the timing of making your payment to when the uh, line of credit actually or the credit actually shows up as available on your line of credit versus trying to dial it up to 11 in month one. You know, I'd I'd rather see people, you know, do the the base minimum for a few months, get get their feet wet, and sort out like what that actual cash flow is going to look like before they dive off the deep end. Perfect. Now, one of the things I want to touch on is that the book repeatedly makes claims, and every time Robinson presents, that the Smith maneuver can be implemented with no new money. So the way that that's typically done is by a fixed, relatively small amounts being invested every month, and the knowledge that your line of credit will grow, assuming you have an adjustable rate mortgage or a fixed rate mortgage. Variable rate mortgages with a fixed payment or anomaly, and if you have that, then you want to make sure you're talking to experts and know what they're doing. But you should always be doing that, but double caution. Um, but on the assumption you have an amortized mortgage where your payment will adjust with interest rates, what's going to happen is you'll pay off a little bit more debt every month which means your line of credit will grow a little bit more every month. And what happens is when you start applying the tax refunds and putting extra payment towards paying off your non-tax deductible mortgage, your payment doesn't shrink. So you owe less interest on the non-tax deductible mortgage side at a natural rate, plus you can accelerate that declining amount of interest you owe each month by making extra payments. So what this does is it means you're going to pay off more and more debt. Now, this is going to be offset by the growing interest cost in your home equity line of credit, but that growing interest cost is also going to have a growing set of room created. Now, the way you can do this is you adjust how much you're investing each month to maintain room on the home equity line of credit so that you can use it to pay for itself, essentially. So you're borrowing on your tax-deductible line of credit to service the interest that was created on your tax-deductible debt. So Chris, do you have any any tips on that? Any concerns? Anything you want to share? No, I mean that like that that is the rule that specifically allows the maneuver to exist is the fact that interest that's charged on borrowed, you know, already on interest. So interest on interest basically is still maintains its deductibility. If if there wasn't that component, then the strategy wouldn't wouldn't exist. And one, I guess one clarification is you have to actually do the math. Um, I have seen a lot of clients that, you know, they got very, very fortunate. They locked in for a mortgage at, you know, 2.05 or 1.95, but their line of credit is going to be at 6.7 or it's going to be at 7.1. And even if you had deductible, even if that 7.1 was deductible, at 40%, your effective tax rate is far higher than the non-deductible tax rate. So now you're intent, the more you kind of 
plunge in there and convert over, you're making a choice to pay more interest on a real basis, right? This is this is an adjusted um, an amount, and it's still more money is leaving your pocket than you than has to, and so in in that regard, you should be doing the math because people will always come. You know, it's human nature that they want a simple answer, and so they just say, well here here's the scenario does is this my in my interest well you have to compare two two things and so my preferred way to do it is compare what would be my you know financial position at the end of paying my mortgage and what would be my fin financial position it, under a certain set of assumptions right the assumptions of my tax rates my interest that I've paid, how much I was actually able to invest, and actually comparing them at, you know, year 15, if your mortgage was going to be paid off at year 15, not at year eight, where the accelerated, you know, because you're cash dammy, you got that mortgage paid off extra fast. And so now it's paid off in year eight, you should be comparing it back to where you would have been if you hadn't implemented the strategy. So whatever your mortgage would have normally been paid off, that should be your point of comparison. And too many people don't actually do a comparison or run the numbers on both sets of, of contexts. No, it's something we see quite regularly. And it's interesting how every time you add a layer, and I'll use the example of your mortgage is 2%, your HELOC 7.2. Layer one is even if you're at a 50% tax bracket, it costs you money to convert that debt. At the end of the day, if you're doing, let's say, cash damming, where you're simply eliminating non-tax deductible debt and you're replacing it in a tax deductible way, but you're not creating an investment that earns a return. Level one is that doesn't make sense. Level two is how long until your renewal date? What will you reasonably renew at? What is the likely difference when you renew? If you're creating an investment, what is the growth or the compounding on that investment? When you renew, another thing to consider is how how long until that renewal date and how much money do you have saved up? If you're six months away, the difference in interest rates by going to higher interest rates minimize because it's only a higher cost for six months. The trade-off is what are the limitations to the amount you can pay down your mortgage? Because if you're going to hit prepayment penalties, it might be better to eat that little bit of extra interest cost, knowing that year four, you break even, moving forward, you, you have an ever-growing gap where it was a good choice. But then the flip side, again, is I've seen clients sit on a ton of cash, waiting for it to make sense from an interest perspective. And then they realize, oh, I missed out on compounding of my investments for three years because I tried to get cheap and save 1% interest. So this is where kind of we come in as experts. And this is where I don't single-handedly do this. Chris doesn't single-handedly do this. And the financial planners don't single-handedly do it. We work together and we provide our different expertise. Everybody throws in their concerns. Is your room clean? And that allows us to provide the best solution for you that is a compromise of the best tax advice, the best investment advice, and the best debt advice. And I think it's the only way you can really do this strategy effectively. Otherwise, we'll see situations where people will incur crazy interest costs to create tax deductibility, or they will have crazy tax implications of trying to create some sort of benefit from an interest rate perspective. And at the end of the day, it's important, like Chris mentioned, that you compare what you're doing to what the baseline is. And if you're gonna come out $8,000 ahead 20 years from now, and it's gonna take you two hours a month, why are you doing it? It's just not worth it. So a, a situation I ran by Chris a couple of weeks ago, and maybe we can touch on this if you want, Chris, the cash damning or the, the sweet. Um, I believe the exact terminology Chris used was the juice just wasn't worth the squeeze. And this was not just factoring the return or the, savings you would generate, but also the risk of the CRA getting involved. So Chris, is that an example you're comfortable talking about? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's, again, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I try to simplify things for clients, but I, you know, like to, like to use, you know, the, the example that if you just want to give money away, then I can write you an invoice, right? If you want to just give money, I, I'm tax deductible for my advice. So if you want to just give the bank money, for the sake of getting a tax deduction, well, I can write you some invoices, and uh, so we we can make we can make this a win win situation. Um, the question is again, like you were touching on, is 
are you actually, you know, are you creating new income with this borrowing, right? That is, that's from, from my aspect, the, the most critical thing. I think people often, they get very, very focused on the deductibility component. You know, no one likes writing a check to CRA. That's, it's never, ever going to be a fun, fun thing. The, the question is like, what are, what's the trade-offs? What are, what are the actual balances of things? And, uh, and making sure that it actually works for your financial future, not just doing things so that you can, you know, give it to the government. Well, if you're giving it to the, you know, what's, what's the, the saying, cutting off your nose to spite your face, right? You know, you have to make sure that you are advantaged by the situation as well. You know, from my perspective, you know, as an accountant, there's only so much that we play within the realm of percentages and, and everybody wants this mythical tax-free income. And there's very, very limited forms of tax-free income. Most of accounting is a matter of optimization within percentages, right? Taking something that was 25% and getting it down to 20%. And laws of large numbers, a 5% spread on 100, 200 grand, a million dollars, all of a sudden those numbers start to get very, very large. And, but you're not, it's not a realistic expectation that you're going to get down to zero. And so again, like from my personal perspective, the fact that you get to invest your money sooner is more powerful than the fact that you're getting the interest deduction. I, I firmly believe I have conversations with clients all the time. You know, they, they talk about how they don't have enough money at the end of the day to invest. So again, they're in a 25 year payment period for their mortgage. So all of a sudden, you know, they're starting to invest, like Keaton was saying, you know, in their 50s, instead of starting to invest in their 30s or 40s with the Smith Maneuver, allowing compounding to take effect in the background, giving yourself that extra runway. And I believe controlling the additional assets is the more powerful component of the strategy, and that the interest deductibility is just a nice kicker or the cherry on the top of the strategy. Um, I think you shouldn't be choosing it specifically um, for just for tax purposes. Um, there, should, there should be the other consideration of assets. Um, so going back to the, the specific example that you were talking about, it's, it was related to a basement suite. And there's a bunch of a bunch of issues with the, the basement suites, right? Because so let me just give a framework because not everyone's going to know what we're talking about. So yeah. there is an accelerator called cash damming where you can take the revenue of a property, you can use it to pay down your non-tax deductible debt, and then reborrow in a tax deductible way to service for the expenses of properties. Now, with a rental property that's separate, it's generally pretty straightforward and relatively simple from a tax perspective. This situation, someone was trying to use the basement suite in their own home to pay down, which is fine. You can do whatever you want with income. But the, the sticky point was they then wanted to reborrow to pay for expenses on their own home, which is part personal, part basement suite. And so they wanted to just do it on a prorated basis. And there is CRA hates, absolutely hates when things are not clear cut, right? They are very, very well known for throwing the baby out with the bathwater, that as soon as there's a personal component, they are inclined to disregard the entire amount. And so as soon as that person wanted to pay off their personal mortgage bills with through that advanced portion uh, from that line of credit, I knew that there was going to be a lot of risk tied to it and that really the additional advantage to just getting that cash down and converting it slightly faster than the traditional method of just making their payment um, naturally, that accelerator was probably they're going to create a situation where you know it could go sideways very quickly on a CRA audit and whether that risk was going to outweigh the fact that they converted over the debt, you know, four years faster, five years faster. Because if they were just doing the plain Jane Smith maneuver, they were still going to end up getting the debt converted, right? It was only just the fact that they were trying to implement this accelerator that was going to potentially throw them offside. They could have been doing, a, you know, the 
uh, you know, the plain Jane version and still been converting over and getting a lot of the same tax benefits. So again, you know, you should in that scenario be doing three comparisons, right? The baseline comparison, the plain Jane comparison, and, you know, this accelerator comparison to actually see what is my real potential benefit by doing this um, and what additional risks am I taking on? Now, let me ask you, is it safe to make the statement that your tax deductibility on your HELOC is only as strong as the weakest use of the funds? Exactly that. You, so in the situation where let's say you use an accelerator, you did some something, and the CRS says, we, we agree with 90% of what you did, but we don't agree with this 10%. Is it possible outcome that they just eliminate the tax deductibility of the whole pool of funds? It would probably wouldn't be the whole pool of funds, the, but where the issue is, is how far they roll back and the fact that you were compounding the interest on that thing. So if, if that denied portion was in year one and they audit in year tw 10, all of a sudden you've been compounding the interest basically fundamentally on that non-deductible portion. So by the time that they actually back calculate to the year 10, all of a sudden there's a really, really far size of, far more sizable chunk that's non-deductible than you're assuming just because of the original $1,000 offside well, transaction. Wouldn't my concern be though that let's say you're cash damming and you're investing at the same time, if they're on the same line of credit, wouldn't it be next to impossible without you know spending dozens, if not hundreds of hours going through, let's say 10 years of statements to actually separate out what's what? Because you've got this ever shifting balance and interest amount and what is allocated to the cash damming and what's allocated to the investments. Agreed. And you're, you're just exposing yourself to the risk of how much work that auditor is willing to do as compared to them doing some sort of shorthand method, right? That may or may not be in your factor. And again, you know, people, their, their, their counter argument is, well, I would just challenge CRA on that. Well, again, as, as you were just noting, how many hours does that take? Are you involving having to involve a tax lawyer at $1,000 an hour to take CRA to court? Doesn't take too many tax lawyer hours on a challenge to CRA before whatever deductibility you were going to do is offset by how much cash you had to pay out to prove that you were right. And so, you know, proving you are right is a whole different story. No, for sure. Now, one of the most common situations we come across is where people taint the well. They, whether by accident, whether by, so I, I want to go through two examples. One is someone has an investment line of credit and at some point, let's say they borrow to repair the roof on their home. And then six months later, they realize, uh oh, that was a mistake. Can they undo it? The answer is, it depends on the auditor. And I've seen auditors that are relatively flexible. Also, how big is the time gap? between the payment and the repayment, all, all of those sorts of things um, come, come into play. And that's why what's the, again, the, the saying is an, an ounce of, what an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure or something to that effect. You know, that's why separating out some, some of the line of credit, if you believe that you might have expenses that are going to come up that you, you know, would have to temporarily fund through credit, you know, having a, a completely separate line of credit or and or a segment of your other line of credit that you dedicate for personal stuff instead, you know, up, and doing that up front before you need it will give you that margin of safety versus just saying, oh, it should be fine. Because we, we see audits all of the time, and I would say the vast majority of time CRA is somewhat reasonable. You know, for instance, they ask for receipts for 10 items, and you have nine of the receipts, and you don't have that 10th item, and it's relatively small. I've seen auditors say, that's fine. You, you obviously showed that you were trying to do your best, and you kept nine of the 10, and you're fine. But I have seen auditors that would deny that one expense that, you know, you literally you had nine of them, but they 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 got you and then they will make that adjustment. But the flip side is that if you if they ask for 10 of them and you only have two, they're not going to give you any margin of error. They're going to deny all of the eight 
right there. So if you prove that you are trying your best to maintain and, you know, something slipped up, you know, there is a chance that your that CRA is going to do. But again, especially as an accountant, I don't like to put my chances in a what if or what how what the mood of the auditor is on that day. I'd rather actually have everything documented and everything set to go. So I've heard it the best way that I've come up with explaining it. And I want to see if this is right since I'm getting free accounting advice. Not that this is advice for anyone from Chris, um, is that when you when you have tax deductible debt and you borrow in a non-tax deductible way, essentially the non-tax deductible debt rises to the top. And when you make payments, the payments go towards the bottom, essentially. So your payments go to the tax deductible debt first. Is this an actual rule or is this just called an auditor discretion that you can get caught by? I know that that I mean that's been proven in court. A CRA has won court cases with that. So that is CRA's default position that your repayment is going to be repayment of the deductible debt. So that so this, is the overall risk of tainting um, that line of credit. Is like I said, you temporarily borrow that ten grand for that trip, even if you paid it back a week later. You know there is that risk, and and like I said, proven in court where CRA would say you've just ruined ten ten thousand dollars of deductibility. Okay. Um, the second question I had is let's say someone's cash damming. So they have a portion going to investments and a portion going to cash damming. If they sell that investment property, correct me if I'm wrong, they eliminate the tax deductibility of the debt they use to cash down for that property. Is that correct? Yeah, it becomes uh, complicated quite quickly because obviously if you were doing this for a number of years the interest portion you might sell the property for 200 grand but if you were carrying that cost and cash damming there might be two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of debt tied to it CRA would expect you to put the full proceeds um against it so you'd put your two hundred thousand again back again against that line of credit and that fifty thousand dollar remainder should stay tax deductible because of the history of the income that came through it. But again, you you do have extra complexities there and, and it, it now becomes harder to defend, especially as more and more years go by because it no longer that debt no longer has an income source tied to it. And so you know if at all feasible, you would want to try to extinguish as much of the debt as you could. Um, and kind of reset your your clock and reborrow in a in a very clean pit so do you, on paper. Do you run the risk that they could say, well, that two hundred thousand actually paid off the fifty or the paid off the tax deductible debt first, and then left? It, could the CRA argue the remaining fifty k is the non tax deductible portion? With yeah, the well, same they would premise? say the, the source of income no longer exists. So now that borrowing you know, the, like I said, you have to tie it back to the income and you no longer have the source of income anymore. So there would be a heightened level of risk. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any court cases um, where that's come up, but that is a situation where, you know, it could get a little bit dicey and, and uh, you would have to, you know, tread a little bit softly. Okay, good to know. So it sounds like it is good to separate out cash damming from regular investing. If you had two different HELOCs, it would theoretically be better to separate them just because there is a probability at some point that the investments get sold and not reinvested, aka you sell the property. Yeah, as much as possible. Again, like it becomes the practicality versus the, the risks sort of thing, right? Who, who wants to maintain seven HELOC accounts and a number of bank accounts over a what if situation. And Fair enough. again, accountants are great at parsing the rules and saying you might have a risk profile, but the reality is like, who's actually going to do it to that, that level of detail and not mess up. And that's going to be a very, very small percentage of people. And so, you know, it would ideally be per best practice, but that's not a, it's, I don't know that that would be a, a relevant thing within real life. No, fair enough. And I think the important thing for all these questions is the answer always boils down to it depends based on your situation, what you're doing, and what your risk tolerances are. Um, but I promise to get you out of here on time. So I just want to quickly bang through two questions that got asked. First one is, are accountants fees tax deductible? 
generally yes again deductions and and deductions in general and so this is again um something that is across across the board for all deductions whether it's your business or whether it's investing you have to tie that back to income so generally speaking uh, a an accountant fee um, is deductible if it's in relation to investment income but for instance if you did a tax return and all you had was a t4 um, an investment an accountant fee would not be deductible because it needs to have an additional level of complexity to the return to justify the accountant being involved. So if the if there's investment income, rental, a business, all of those sorts of things, now the accountant fee would be deductible. But there are things called corporate reorganizations or various um, various you know scenarios that you get, and CRA does not allow you to deduct those accountant fees or the legal fees, you actually have to capitalize them and write them off according to over a number of years. Um, in the same way, you know, you for, I mean, it doesn't happen for the vast majority of, of residential um, borrowing or residential, but when you get into really, really large numbers of borrowing, um, you can have a $100,000 fee for getting your mortgage and that's charged up front. Well, CRA doesn't let you write that off in the single year. They make you write that off over the course of a number of years. And so again, things that you would normally assume, oh, that's gonna be deductible fully in one year. Uh, there's always a layer of rules tied to it. And so again, that is a reason to be talking with a professional, especially when you start to get into large numbers. Perfect. And the other thing I wanted to tackle really quickly is the question that Julie asked is, how do you how do you decide on the separation of tax deductions and income for let's say two spouses both on the mortgage? Um, is there a system to it? Does it always have to be 50-50 or is it more about consistency? Uh, it's generally 50-50 if you're borrowing it straight from the property, unless you are actually taking steps to, to separate it, right? I if I was trying to separate it, or like I said, in the case that I did separate it, we set up two separate lines of credit we have our investment portfolio strictly in you know in her name only not a joint investment portfolio and my ownership of my properties and the things that i invested in with my line of credit are strictly in my name so there's a clear delineation versus borrowing from a joint line of credit putting it into a joint investment account and then choosing to split it 90 10 um, you would potentially run yourself offside because CRA, there's a, a rule called the attribution rule. And that is a rule specifically designed to cancel out income splitting between high income spouses and low income spouses. And so in that scenario, you have a, a person who has a million dollar income and their stay at home wife who has zero income. Even if you created a an investment account 100% in her name, if he was the source of all of the funds or the high earner spouse was the source of all of the funds, the income would legally attribute back to that person, even if the portfolio was in the other spouse's name. And so again, people try to get cute with these titles and all of that sort of stuff. CRA is the one who writes the rules and they've been writing these rules for a number of years. They have closed these loopholes multiple times and there are not big gaping loopholes in, in existence there right you know you and so in that regard and, and the way that you get around that is that you actually write a loan between the high income spouse and the low income spouse and they lend the spouse the money in order to do the investment but they physically have to write a check for that interest because CRA has written it in that if you don't write the check for that interest payment on the loan that you've now ruined, that it re-attributes. Re so again, you it's a matter of if you believe that you're being cute, chances are CRA has thought about it. If, if you think about the natural progression, there are CRA hires accountants who have been in business for 40 years you know, they're now 64 or they're 65 and they wind down their practice and CRA hires them for a one-year 
term and they say, what were all the things that you got away with for the last 40 years? How can you tighten this up? And so every year they're hiring people who've been in the practice for four years and they're revising their rules. So generally speaking, if you're trying to be really cute about it, probably somebody's thought about it. Perfect. Well, I think we're going to end with that because I promise I'll let you go. Um, well, I'll tackle some questions. I think Chris has to go, but I really wanted to take this session to illustrate the difference of an accountant who's passionate and knowledgeable about what they do, and that actually takes the time to understand the layers and the different interactions and how everything works together, versus an accountant whose goal is to create as much tax deductions for you as possible, or to keep their fees as low as possible. Um, Chris is by no means the most expensive accountant in Canada, and he's certainly not the cheapest. He falls in the middle, but he's definitely one of the best accounts I've ever worked with or I've ever come across. Believe me, I've burned through dozens in the different real estate investing communities. Um, so this was more about a showcase of who Chris is and what he does, but also the core concept of this is that the interest when you borrow to earn income is generally tax deductible, but it's effing complicated. And that the one component you should never, ever, ever DIY is the taxes. You wanna go index, I don't recommend it, but you'll probably be okay. You wanna to go to RBC and get them to set up your mortgage directly? I don't recommend it, but you'll probably be okay. You start going on Google and reading Reddit to figure out tax code, like there's just so much to it and there's so many different interactions and there's rules that interact with rules and please don't DIY the tax stuff, please. It's the best three, four, five, six hundred dollars $600 you'll ever spend. And the, the one thing I always share about accountants is that they cost more than doing it yourself. No ifs, ands, or buts. Generally speaking, in my experience, if you're a regular person, they're not going to save you more money than they cost every year. But three, four, twice, there's going to be a few times in your life where a good accountant is going to come in and they're going to save you a shitload of money. And they're going to save you more than the lifetime's worth of fees. Probably not this year. Probably not next year. But it's at some point in your life. And that's, in my opinion, why it's worth investing in a good accountant. And in my opinion, too, you build a good relationship. You work with them during the good times. If you do run into issues with the CRA, I personally believe the accountant's a lot more likely to go above and beyond for a 15-year client who's always worked with them and been good work with than, hey, Chris, nice to meet you. Uh, uh, Keaton told me to call you. Yeah, I'm being audited. And, uh, I, I think I'm going to go bankrupt. Do you want to get involved? Like, <laughs> probably not the most motivating call. Yeah, and 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 the reality of the situation is often there's quite a bit of history, right? And somebody somebody comes to us, and you know, and and for instance, it's quite common. You know, it was an elderly family or an elderly person, and they filed their own taxes, or the daughter filed the taxes for a number of years, and then the person passed away, and they want us to do the estate taxes. Well there's a whole lot of history as to how all of those assets came into play. And it's really, really hard to dig back retroactively versus like, oh yeah, I have the last 10, 15 years of files and I know that history and I know how those assets are all constructed and we can move through this estate in a, in a more, you know, streamlined way. Or similarly, you know, people come and they say, well, I sold my business last year. What can we do to save my tax? Like, well, you, you can get invent a time machine, talk to me three years ago, and we could have play, we could put some things into structure before you sell your business. But now that the business is sold, it is what it is. There's no, no ways around it. And so again, preventative, there's, the difference is you're allowed, legally allowed and proven in tax court that you can tax plan. CRA does not force you to have to pay them extra. So you can proactively structure your things in your advantage, provided you are documenting and proving things. You are not allowed to retroactively adjust things to your favor. That is tax evasion. And you will get yourself into trouble when you're going backwards in time. You are perfectly okay to structure things in a tax efficient way going forward. So that being said, like I, like I said, and as you noted, I've got to get myself on the road. So it's we been... got 30 seconds and you're free. Uh, where are you based? People are asking. And who do you work with? Yeah, so I, I'm 
Our public practice is based in Chilliwack. We, our primary focus is owner managed business. Uh, our, so that means that we're mostly focused on corporate tax work. Um, we do have limited um, availability for personal uh, tax work. And generally speaking, um, as we were noting about the difference in value, I, I want to make sure that I'm providing value to my clients. So for the most part, I, I don't deal with simple, straightforward tax returns. I like to deal with investors, proactive people, people who are trying to grow, you know, have opportunities that are coming up where they need to, to be planning and doing structuring. Um, so real estate investors um, typically are the only, you know, sort of personal only clients that we take on, um, whereas otherwise our business is primarily focused on, on corporate work uh, because there's natural, you know, we, we try to implement things in a holistic way and integrate corporate stuff with their personal. So every time we sign new corporate work, there's natural growth in our uh number of personal tax returns that we deal with. And there's only so many days during personal tax season. So as, as much as it grows and as much as I already work crazy hours, you know, it, it, there is, there is physical constraints. And do you work for clients outside of BC? I do. Yeah. Um, there generally is not an issue in that regard because I'm still providing the work from BC. You know, if there's, if there, I don't do a whole lot of international work. I don't do any work like U S taxes. Um, and what that's about Quebec or Quebec. Yes, exactly. Whenever there's unique sort of tax codes, um, you know, I stick within my wheelhouse and you should consult the expert in, in those taxes. Um, but yeah. Amazing. Well, thanks for coming out. I know you got to run, so I won't keep you, but like I said, uh, Chris is not shy to say what he doesn't know or what he doesn't do. So uh, it's nice to work with someone whose goal is not to convince you why you should work with them, but rather trying to figure out are they actually a good fit to help you and can they help you?